60 Minutes Rewind. Last Thursday, this broadcast lost one of its pillars. Ed Bradley succumbed to CLL, a form of leukemia. Tonight, we remember Ed the way we think he'd want us to as a dedicated reporter who represented the highest standards of this craft, a man who inspired a whole generation of journalists with a calm elegance that was never an act. He was the genuine article. And so we begin with the extraordinary contribution he made to this broadcast, 26 years of rooting out the truth, exposing the dark side of the human condition, and celebrating the best of it, and having a high old time along the way. For example, the day 42-year-old Ed Bradley met the delicious 64-year-old Lena Horn. It will come as no surprise, this was Ed's favorite story. You ever think of getting married again? No, I'm too... Don't tell me you're too old. No, well, no, I don't think that's got a lot to do with it, except that I'm so old and I'm set in a lot of ways I would hate to change. I'm spoiled. I wouldn't lay that burden (laughs) on anybody, no. When you say that I'm a rich, juicy, ripe plum again? Yeah, but you can't help your sexual nature, you know. (laughs) That's what that line means. (laughs) If a lady treats other people as she'd like to be treated, then she's allowed to go and roll in the grass if she wants to. Even if she's 64? Even if she's 64. If I arrived at the pearly gates and St. Peter said, what have you done to deserve entry? I'd just say, did you see my Lena Horne story? Ed Bradley let people reveal themselves, whether they were angels or demons like Timothy McVeigh. Am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? Or am I able to talk to you man to man? Most people in this country think you are the face of evil, don't they? They do. I'm just being me. Everyone in America saw the pictures on television, heard the news on the radio. What was your reaction when you saw those pictures? I think like everyone else, I thought it was, it was a tragic event. And that's all I really want to see. And the children? I thought it was it was terrible that there were children in the building. Ed could not resist the call of the great stories, and most of the great stories are about killing and dying in the dusty and forlorn ends of the earth. Oh yeah, not la ba. In Kosovo and Somalia, death by famine and death through neglect, indifference and ignorance. General, is there a famine today in your country? Absolutely not. There is no famine today in the Sudan. But when we traveled last week to rebel-held southern Sudan, it was obvious that hunger is already taking its toll on those who are weakest. We won't identify the village because when it was mentioned before, the government bombed this hospital. How often do you do this? Working for 60 minutes for Ed, in fact, for all of us, was the great liberation from routine. Here he was in the best playground a reporter could ask for, and did he make the most of it? Schlepping through the jungle to keep an appointment with a Mexican rebel, Subcomandante Marcos, international man of mystery. How many are you? Uh, this is a uh, top secret. Top secret. <laughs> top secret. For a calm, reflective sojourn, Bradley paddles his way in search of the elusive ivory-billed woodpecker. Our intrepid woodsman never spotted Woody, but he did get a story out of it. Or sharing a sauna and dinner with the general commanding the Soviet nuclear strike force and staying more or less sober after a force feeding of vodka. And thank you for the sauna. Uh, Very good Russian sauna. Just one more sacrifice at the altar of journalism. Ed relished, really relished his job, all 500 stories he did over 25 years. Sometimes this can be a difficult job. Where else do you get the chance to catch the tiger by the tail? (laughs) That'd be the best shot of my career. If somebody is is coming at you and trying to... Or where else do you get to bring Air Jordan down to Earth? 
if, if I've got the ball and you pull on jerseys? No. I mean, you can... <laughs> See, I can steal you. Uh -huh. Well, so I can owe you for if, doing if, things. If I want to go this, yeah. Uh, Simple, huh? Yeah. <laughs> And he could project his own coolness with the best of them. Hanging out with the entertainment giants of his time, the truly great, like Olivier. Stupid, stubborn, and I'm sorry, that's me. The matinee idols, the weirdos, and the outrageous. I just really irritate people, you know? How are you sick? I'm a sick man. And music, music, music. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll is. Well, you're beyond that. Some of that's still in there, I think. Still want to be the best band in the world? Still want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bob Dylan hadn't done a television interview in, I guess, almost 20 years. I'd read somewhere that you wrote Blowing in the Wind in 10 minutes. Is that right? Probably. Sometimes you'd ask a question and he'd say, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to say, come on, Bob, give it up, give it up. Mm-mm. Uh -uh. He played a little blackjack with Ray Charles and got taken for a ride. The first hand you got blackjack and Wait I shuffled the cards. How do I know that you're not cheating me? Well, how can I cheat you if you gave me the cards? I ain't touched the cards. Bradley on camera was the same Bradley off camera, but he did have a playbook of body language that accompanied every interview. The dubious sage, and what did get you to the point, and puzzled disbelief. I, I hate to say it, Dennis, but it just doesn't, on the surface, look good. Gaspipe Casso, hitman extraordinaire. I shot him a couple of times. The kid died. Well, what's a couple? Uh, uh, more than a couple. It's a couple. I, I, I really, I don't know the exact amount. Maybe I shot him uh, 10 times, 12 times. Maybe 15 even. It could have been 15. The story will continue after this. I tell you, Charm. It's practically in the 60 Minutes <laughs> Charter that correspondents <laughs> shift from the silly to the weightiest of issues. Please help us. Just as in America, race was an important fact of life for Ed Bradley. In Tulia, Texas, Ed met the undercover narcotics agent who was accused of framing poor blacks, a man who used that word. The word mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I've used that word. I've used it a lot. Yeah, what's up? Is that a greeting you'd use with me? Oh, no, sir, not you. It was Many themes coursed through the life of Ed Bradley. Justice, justice served and justice denied. As a boy, he read about the murder of Emma Till, a 14-year-old killed by white racists in Mississippi. Emmett Till and I were the same age when he died, and it was the first time that I had a real understanding of what life in the South could be like, that here was a kid who whistled at a white woman and was tortured beaten and killed for a whistle. So to go back years later to do that story and to knock on the door of the woman he whistled at, there was a lot of emotion involved in that. Moments later, her son, Frank Bryan, arrived, and we tried to talk to him. Can we talk to Mrs. Dunham? Can you talk to me either? Can I talk you get her to come out? No. I have some questions I'd like to ask her about Emmett Till. Okay. Will she come out and talk to us? I just tell you. Tell me again. Goodbye. I'm back? I said goodbye. Goodbye. Yes. You're leaving? No, you are. End of conversation, but not the end of the story. The Justice Department reopened the case, and there was Johnny D and Rolando Cruz, both released from death row after Ed's reports. This is a story. A whole about raft ten of women. stories that are the bread and butter of 60 Minutes. Years, stories of outrages against the poor, the industrial and official criminality, and disregard of human life. Stories that became a forum for the powerless. The people who live there live in the kind of squalor Americans would like to believe no longer exists in this country. Well, uh, let me tell you this. He rarely let his emotions show, but he did make it clear that he would not accept any BS. 
Come on, Jack. Persistent. Tell me why I should believe you. Stubborn. Wait, wait, excuse me, are you serious? Fair. Help me understand this. When someone is here from the city on welfare, and when he had the goods, as he did when he checked into, literally checked into a welfare hotel that was ripping off the city of New York, he was relentless. All right, call the police. These guys are here. What about the home on the floor? I've got two rooms here. I'm scared you. Okay. Fine. I've got room 1003. I'm in room 1003. Why should I go outside? I'm a guest at this hotel. Go outside? No. I'm staying in room 1003. He was also quick to cover the story that broke the heart of a nation. Just days after the planes hit, he listened to the desperate disbelief of one woman who could not accept that her husband was gone. We're a strong group and we're gonna get through this. I can see that. Mm -hmm. Oh God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Help us out in any other way. I can. Just yeah, whatever you can. can. He was a big man with a big heart. He never had children of his own, but he had the instincts any father could envy. We found that going through our archives last night. Alex, do you remember your name? You hold my finger? You squeeze my finger? Good boy. We're just a battle. Any number of moments from various stories that demonstrated the man's tenderness. You want to go to college? Much as it kills me, yes. Much as it kills you. Why was it, would it kill you going to college? Because they got um, people, words that I don't know. But you'll learn new words every year. So that by the time you get to college, you'll know all those words. Yeah, but they're not going to teach me on those words because they will think that I'm so smart, I know those words. Trust me, you'll be okay. Okay. The oldest kid he ever interviewed was a mischievous, cigar-smoking, 92-year-old named George Burns. Sing harmony? No, I can't carry a tune. Are you sure? Positive. For she can carry a gun good as any mother's son, that's one note. For she can carry a gun good as any mother's son. For she can carry a gun good as any mother's son. Murray. For she can, go ahead. For she can carry a gun good as any mother's son. See with harmony. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, can I go out to Vegas with you? Sure, yeah, I mean, we'll play together. You got room for me in your act? You, you kick the back of your head, we'll have a great finish. <laughs> <laughs> a great finish. <laughs> and what could be a greater finish in summing up the life of Ed Bradley than his visit with Muhammad Ali? A silent Ali, 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 who got Ed Bradley as he's never been gotten. Well, <coughs> sometimes he does that. Huh? It happened after the Frazier fight in Manila. What happened? I don't know. I wasn't there, but ever since the Frazier fight in Manila, Muhammad will. It's sort of like like narcolepsy. He'll just start sleeping, but he'll have these flashbacks, and he'll have, it's like nightmares, and his face will twist up like he's boxing, and he'll throw punches at people. And he does it at night sometimes. Sometimes I have to get out of the bed. Whenever he starts snoring heavily, I have to get out of the bed because I know it's going to start. Uh, so when he starts, what's the next room? So he's not putting on when he's no, snoring. This actually happens. Mm -hmm. And the doctor told us not to really try to wake him if that but, does happen, because he might end up with a heart attack because mm -hmm. it might frighten him. So I don't. I just get up and move. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the hard part. You have to sort of...